Today's story in Peter's life is recorded in John chapter 21. So if you have your Bibles, that's where we're going to be spending most of our time. But let me introduce today's message in this way. How many of you here enjoy eating a good breakfast? Okay, I think most people do. They enjoy eating a good breakfast. Now, I personally am not a big breakfast eater. I eat breakfast every day, but I don't eat a whole lot. Now, since I've been here for a while, and I know some of you have heard me say this many times, either in a sermon or a small group meeting, who can tell me what my favorite breakfast meal is? <laughs> peanut butter on toast. That's right. You got it. Toast and peanut butter. It's what I've been eating according to what my mom told me since I was two years old. Toast and peanut butter, and that is so good, and I still eat that almost every morning now. In fact, mom told me when I was four years old, she took me to the doctor, and she told the doctor, something's wrong with this guy. All he'll eat is toast and peanut butter. And the doctor laughed and said, that's all right. There's nutritional value in that. I'm sure his taste buds will expand. And he was exactly right. There aren't too many things that I don't like today. But when it comes to breakfast, it is still toast and peanut butter. And it's got to be Jif peanut butter. It can't be Skippy. It can't, my mom used to, to buy when I was little. She, she decided she was going to get something a little cheaper. She bought this peanut butter called Shed's. Shed's peanut butter. And I knew when she did, because it wasn't GIFs. I said, Mom, this is different. This isn't GIFs. <laughs> and from that time forward, I've always eaten GIF peanut butter. But even if you are a big breakfast eater, and maybe you enjoy a variety of foods at breakfast time, I doubt many of us have started the day by eating fish and bread. Anyone ever had fish and bread for breakfast? Now, if you're a fisherman, you might. That is exactly what Jesus cooked for his disciples that morning we're going to talk about today on the beach around the Sea of Galilee. We're going to see that Peter was evidently still struggling to get past his failure. Remember what we talked about two weeks ago? He denied Jesus three times. But Jesus is going to give Peter the opportunity to be reinstated to his role of apostle and leader or as the title of the message puts it, Peter's going to get a new beginning. The most important truth we can learn today is that with God there is always an opportunity for a new beginning. And this was something that Peter desperately needed and graciously received. We too have been given the opportunity for a new beginning. Here's what I want to do. I want to follow the pattern I've followed a lot during this sermon series. First, we're going to take a look at a little bit of background as to what's happening here in John 21. And then after that, we're going to make some applications. We're going to learn some lessons that we can apply to our lives today from this story of Peter's new beginning found in John 21. But before we do, as we always do, let's ask God for his blessing, his wisdom, and his understanding as we spend a few moments in his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we count it a privilege each time you help us open your word and study its truth, and we're especially grateful for this privilege we have of being here together today. Lord, I pray as we open your word that you will use me in a way that you will be pleased with. May what is said today be accurate according to your word, may be what you want to be said, and may it be challenging and helpful to all of us who are here today and those who are listening. Lord, I thank you that you are a God of second and third and fourth chances. And Father, you never give up on us, even when we sin, even when we sometimes give up on you. And Lord, we are grateful for that. And I pray, Father, if there's anyone here today that needs a new beginning, I pray you'll begin to touch their hearts right now and help them to know that no matter what they've done in their past, they can have a new beginning today. And we praise you for that. Lord, use me. I ask for your help and give us your wisdom and understanding. That's our prayer. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. The background in this passage in John 21 begins with Peter and a few of his friends hanging out together. Peter and his friends decided to go fishing, but caught nothing the entire night. So Jesus appears 
And they didn't recognize him at first, but he tells them to try again. I want to read it beginning in verse 4 and going through verse 6. John chapter 21, we read, But when the day was now breaking, they'd been fishing all night, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus, at least not yet. So Jesus said to them, Children, do you not have any fish to eat, do you? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find the fish. Now, for whatever reason, they did what this so-called stranger, at least stranger at the moment, asked them to do. And they caught a huge catch, 153, according to verse 11. Now, I don't know how many fishermen we have here, but if you catch 153, that's a pretty good day, I would say. 153. Now, this must have caused Peter to remember a similar occasion almost three years earlier when Jesus had performed the same miracle. That's found in Luke chapter 5. And we talked about this earlier on in this sermon series. This new but very similar experience was no coincidence, I believe. It was a wonderful parallel to that day on the same shore when Jesus called his disciples to be fishers of men. And then we're told John then recognized that the stranger is Jesus. And he tells Peter in verse 7, it is the Lord. No longer than it took for John to say that, Peter hops out of the boat, he dives into the water, and he didn't stop to think, and that's what he usually doesn't do, stop to think. And he didn't stop to think, he just jumped into the water. And he goes swimming towards the uh, shore in order to hook up with Jesus. And so that's what he does. Then the boat followed, following with that net full of 153 fish. Well, when they got to the beach, they found that Jesus had cooked a breakfast of fried fish and some bread, then invited the men to have breakfast with him. Now, personally, that doesn't sound to me like a very appealing breakfast, but I'm sure that those fishermen loved it. In fact, verse 9 says, So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already made and fish placed on it and bread. Now, perhaps it's significant in what we're going to be talking about that happened after breakfast that the only other time the Greek term for charcoal fire is used in the New Testament is in this same book of John back in chapter 18. It refers to the charcoal fire in the courtyard where Peter denied the Lord. By one charcoal fire, he denied Jesus. By the other charcoal fire, he was going to be restored by Jesus. Jesus told them to bring some of the fish that they had caught to add to the meal. And so they all ate together. A perfect breakfast on the beach. And I'm sure it was a good day, but that leads me to the most important part of the story. And that are the lessons. What is it that we can learn from this story about Peter's new beginning? Well, first, Jesus now asked Peter an eternally significant question. He simply asked, do you love me? Jesus had fed them physically, and now he's about to give them some spiritual food. Now, I'm going to zero in on what Jesus says to Peter because he, he singularly points out Peter here. Beginning in verse 15, I want to read through verse 17. This is the main text. We're going to talk about a little bit more too, but this is the main text. So they get done eating breakfast, and here's what happens. Now, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. What Jesus 
was asking Peter was probably the most dreaded question that he could ask Peter, but it was the one he needed to hear. It was the one that needed to be asked. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now think about what it must have felt for Peter that Jesus asked him this question not once, not twice, but three times. Perhaps Jesus did this to give Peter an opportunity to confess his love for Jesus the same number of times that he had earlier denied the Lord. There isn't any question that Jesus was bringing up that painful subject of Peter's boasting in that upper room that we talked about two weeks ago. Remember what he said? Jesus has said, you're all going to fall away. Peter said, not me, Lord. Even if all these others fall away, I'm not going to. That's why he asked, Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these guys? Jesus is giving Peter the opportunity to face his unconfessed sin and unresolved guilt so he could fix it. And I want all of us here today, I want to encourage you to ask yourself a very personal, sometimes very painful question. I don't want you to think about anybody else right now. I want you to think about your own life. Is there any hidden sin? Is there any unresolved guilt that continues to burden your soul? I want you to know today that God wants us to find forgiveness and he wants us to find freedom from sin. He wants to give us, like he gave Peter, a new beginning. Now, I've heard people say regarding this passage, whew, boy, I'm glad I wasn't in Peter's shoes. I wouldn't want Jesus to be looking at me and asking me that question three different times. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you really love me? All that Jesus is. See, he's still asking that question. And we might quickly answer, well, of course, Jesus, I love you. But then he says, really? Do you really love me? That's what he's asking us today. Do you really love me? How are you showing it? Four reasons why this is an important question for all of us to answer. First, Jesus' question reassures our hope for a second chance. Now, this is the third time, at least according to the scripture, there may be more, but at least the third time that Jesus was with Peter since his resurrection. And I can imagine that Peter was feeling pretty awkward. Maybe he was dying to say, I'm sorry for what I did, Lord, but embarrassed to say anything. Maybe he didn't even think that Jesus would want to have anything to do with him again, with what he did on the night he was betrayed. So when Jesus took the initiative and approached the subject, it must have been a big relief for Peter. I remember reading about this school program, and I think it was a great program. They would send tutors into hospitals to help students who were in the hospital keep up with their schoolwork. And they had people that had volunteered to do this. And so one lady, she had volunteered. She'd done this before. She was given an assignment about going to the hospital to help this boy. She didn't know his condition. She got the assignment. She went in to meet the boy. And upon arriving, she was shocked to discover the boy was in the burn unit. And he had burns all over his body. And she kind of looked at him and just started stammering a little bit. Finally, she said, well, I'm here to teach you. I'm here to teach you about nouns and adverbs today. She struggled through the whole lesson. She left feeling horrible. Didn't think she did a good job at all. The following day, she showed up again. And before she went to the room, a nurse stopped her. What did you do to that boy? Well, the nurse thought she'd done something wrong. She started to apologize. And then the nurse continued, ever since you left yesterday, his whole attitude has changed. He's fighting back. He's responding to treatment. What did you do? She didn't know what to say. Two weeks later, the boy said it himself. He explained, I figured that they wouldn't send a teacher to help me work on nouns and adverbs if I was dying. He had hope. Isn't that what we all need? Hope. 
That's a powerful motivation. Jesus would not have sought out Peter and asked him, do you love me, if there is no such thing as a second chance. Jesus' question wasn't an inquiry to discover the condition of Peter's heart. It wasn't to determine his level of devotion. Jesus already knew that. He knew Peter's heart. Jesus wasn't trying to make Peter feel worse because of his failures. This wasn't ridicule. It was reconciliation. Jesus was giving Peter an opportunity to express his true heart and was gracefully giving him another chance. I'm glad we serve a God who gives second chances, aren't you? We're, we all know what that means. I read about a letter, and, and this is an interesting story. It was dated February the 6th, 1974. It was addressed to the United States government. And the handwriting was shaking, but inside the letter, it said, I am sending $10 for blankets I stole in World War II. My mind could not rest. Sorry I'm late. Signed, an XGI. And then in PS, he added, I want to be ready to meet God. Yes, everyone needs some hope. So I continued reading about this, did a little more background. Here's an amazing statistic. Since 1811, do you realize the United States government has collected and stored such letters? Tons of them. People have given back to the United States since 1811 over three and a half million dollars because they did something that was wrong. One Colorado woman sent in two stamps to redeem herself for having used one stamp twice. A Salem, Ohio man submitted $1 because he flattened a few pennies on the railroad tracks as a kid and later came to understand there's a law against that. These were people who needed a second chance. We all need second chances. We can do well most of the time. Oh, we can live for the Lord most of the time. And all of a sudden, we say something harsh to a friend, a family member, a co-worker. Or we pretend we're too busy to help someone only because we really don't want to do it. We pass along some gossip that we know should have been stopped when it came to us. Or we deceive our employer to make ourselves look better than we are. We've all been there. We've done things like that. Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. God didn't say that what you earn for a sin is a bad mood or a bad day. No, sin is fatal and we are guilty in God's eyes. Now your friends will tell you, well, don't feel so bad about it. Just ignore it. Be happy. You agree and you feel better for a while till you look at yourself in the mirror the next morning. Still there. Guilt hasn't gone away. Legists will tell you, work the guilt away. Just do more good deeds than bad ones. Just balance the scale. If you've done all these bad deeds, just make sure you do more good deeds, and then you're going to be on God's right side. The Bible doesn't say that. How do you know that you've done enough? Deep down, if you know the Bible, you know the Bible teaches we aren't good enough. That's why Jesus went to the cross. We live in a last one standing world where well, we're talking about spelling bees, sports playoffs, job interviews, government elections. The aim is to be the last one standing when everyone else fails or falls or is defeated. Jesus' question, do you love me, was Peter's second chance. It was his opportunity to express his devotion anew. It was his hope. And it is ours by God's grace. No matter how poorly you have done, Jesus, who died for every sin that you and I have ever committed, and rose from the grave, looks us in the eye, and he asks us again, do you love me? Second lesson we can learn is this. Jesus' question challenges our commitment. I believe there's certainly a good reason why Jesus asked Peter three different times if he loved him. I've already mentioned that Peter did deny Jesus three times, and so Jesus asked him three times if he loved him. I don't think that's a coincidence. 
He wants to get Peter's attention and get him to really think hard and deep about his commitment. We know today that love must be more than just words, more than just zeal and passion. Love is action. It must be genuine. Peter had boasted that his devotion was greater than the others, but he blew it. And so now Jesus asked him to probe the truth of his love. Peter, do you really love me more than these guys? Do you love me more than home and family and friends and job? Would Peter's love hold firm when he was again in the midst of his enemies? Based on historical record, it did. If you say to someone that you're dating or someone that you're married to, you say to them, I love you, honey. You don't want them to say in return, that's nice. I mean, what's that going to do, right? You want to hear, I love you too, sweetheart, right? I mean, that's just the way it works. You want your beloved to share the same devotion that you have for them. And I believe we see something similar to that in this exchange between Jesus and Peter. Jesus was getting Peter to come to terms with his love for him. Peter confessed very sincerely and very humbly, you know I do, Jesus. It was the best he could offer, at least at that moment. Maybe he wanted it to be more. But this question is still valid today. And it falls on our ears. We too must answer that question. Jesus is asking, Sam, do you really love me? He's asking you the same question. Be honest about your commitment. Is it sometimes there and sometimes not there? Peter's intention was to die for Jesus if need be. He not only boasted of his devotion, we know what happened when Jesus was arrested in the garden. Remember we talked about that two weeks ago. What did Peter do? Took his sword out and cut the ear off of Malchus. Remember that? He was going to defend Jesus. Peter was not a fair weather follower in intention, but like the rest of us, he was not consistent in practice. And I think this is what is so encouraging about this exchange between Peter and Jesus. Jesus takes us where we are and then invites us to follow him. Once we confess where we truly are, then he takes us to where we need to be. That's what Christianity is all about. And that's the next lesson. Jesus' question helps to direct us to love like God loves. Jesus asks, do you love me? Peter replies, as we all must. You know I do, Lord. I hope that's our answer. But this gives Jesus the opportunity to give direction to the way we express our love for him. And he gives two directives we're going to talk about. He said, feed my sheep or tend my sheep, meaning love others. And then we're going to talk about a little bit later. He said, follow me. Each time, Peter responded affirmatively to the question. Jesus said, Feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. He's telling him to put his love in action. You love me by loving the flock. Be a servant leader who tends to the flock. How do we show love for our Lord today? How do we show love for Jesus? Let me give you some examples. We show our affection, we show our devotion for Jesus When you bring a donation for VBS or you volunteer to be here at a funeral dinner or you teach a Bible class or you're part of a small group or you stack chairs up on a Sunday, which many of you do. You show your love for Jesus when you pray for and give support to a struggling friend, when you take on someone under your wing to mentor him or her, when you bring a neighbor or co-worker to church with you on Sunday. Jesus wants to make us co-workers, co-laborers with him. We become his hands. We become his feet in this world as we minister to one another. That's how we show love to Jesus. It's expressed in unselfish service and love to others. One final lesson we can learn from this story. Jesus' question challenges our tendency to compare ourselves with others. 
Now let me lead unto this. We get to verse 19. Jesus simply says, follow me. And yet we think, isn't that what Peter had been doing? But Jesus wants us to follow and keep following him. And when we fall, like Peter fell, he lovingly helps us to our feet. And again, he says, follow me. So Jesus first goes through this analogy of Peter being able to dress himself and go where he wanted to go in verse 18. He said, truly, truly, I tell you, this is Jesus speaking to Peter. When you were younger, you used to put on your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will put your belt on you and bring you to where you do not want to go. Now, what's that all about? Jesus gives the explanatory remark in the next verse as to what he means by this. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. I'm guessing Peter must have been shocked that Jesus would discuss his own death in such an open matter. No doubt Peter was rejoicing that Jesus was willing to talk to him. I'm guessing by this time he's realizing Jesus is ready to restore him, to give him a new beginning. Maybe Peter was thinking, well, I've already faced the greatest battles I'm going to face. But no, Jesus said, you're going to face greater battles. You got to be ready to live and you got to be ready to die for me. That's what Jesus was telling Peter. Listen, this, I believe this is true. Ultimately, when a person has settled the matter of death in their life, and what I mean by that is, when you come to the understanding that when you die, you're going to be fine because you know what Jesus did for you. And when you die, you're going to heaven to be there forever. And if you're a Christian, you can know that without any shadow of a doubt. When that's settled in your heart and in your mind, that's when you can serve others. That's when you can live the way God wants you to live. Peter would be required not only to live for the Lord, but also to die for the Lord. And I don't think there's any doubt Peter understood exactly what Jesus was saying. Tradition tells us Peter was crucified upside down. That was how he died. In his death, Peter glorified God and God glorified him. But at this point, Peter did something somewhat foolish, as he had a tendency to do, but I think it's something we would have done. Look at verses 20 and 21. Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following him. We know that was John. The one who has also leaned back on his chest at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who is betraying you? So Peter, upon seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? He's asking Jesus, Lord, what about John? If what you're saying is going to happen to me, I'm going to have to die for you. What about John? He was doing what we do so many times in life. We want to compare ourselves to others. Here was Jesus' response in verse 22. Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Jesus made it clear to Peter that he had only one concern and it had nothing to do with anybody else in his life. It had to do with him. He needed to follow Jesus. And I'm going to tell you today, that's what your concern should be. You shouldn't be concerned about what's going to happen to anybody else as far as it relates to you, that somehow they're going to get something better than you're going to get. Your concern is follow Jesus. That was the point he was making to Peter. Follow me. I'll take care of everybody else. You make sure that you follow me. Oh, we like to compare ourselves with others about how faithful or good we are. We like to make sure we're getting the same deal as everyone else. But Jesus makes it perfectly clear our relationship with him is personal. And he wants us individually to follow him. It's as if he was stating to John, listen, my relationship with John and what I have in store for him is between him and me. 
You just be concerned about your personal responsibility, and that responsibility is follow me. I've given you some orders. Tend my sheep, feed my flock, shepherd my lambs. Those are what I want you to do. Follow me. And so by these words, Jesus gently rebuked Peter, reminding him that his job was to follow Jesus, period. As the praise team comes today, and leading Peter to restoration and leading him to a new beginning, Jesus demonstrated that the most important issue in returning to God is to answer the question, do you love me? That's the question I'm asking you today. Jesus asks, do you love me? I'm asking, do you love Jesus? And I want you to understand this. This new beginning, this restoration, this forgiveness that Peter received was not partial. It was total. It was complete. So let me end by saying what I said at the beginning. The most important truth we can learn today is that with God there is always the opportunity for a new beginning. Jesus is still asking, do you love me? As we end today, what will your answer be? Jesus is asking, do you love me?